This is our Sunday School lesson for February the 12th. It is lesson number 11 from Unit 3. And I'm reading the title of that lesson from the Standard Lesson Commentary. And the title is, New Birth Brings Freedom. Our devotional reading is Romans 8. Verses 1 through 11, our background scripture is Galatians 4, and our printed text is Galatians 4, verses 8 through 20. Our key verse is read from the King James Version, and it reads, Now after that ye have known God, are rather are known of God, how turned ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. And that is the ninth verse of the fourth chapter of Galatians. Now our lessons aims or to identify the sole source of true freedom and to explain how reliance on anything other than Christ represents a failure to receive God's message. Our lesson uh, for this Sunday has a great purpose. Uh, it is a carryover from our previous lesson from last week. And the significance of our lesson is focused on being free from attachments that are not beneficial for us. Um, the text uh, speaks of us being enslaved, uh, that uh, we are in bondage uh, to certain practices or customs or ways of life, even beliefs that are contrary to the freedom of life that Christ gave, came to give to us. And so it's good for us to have uh, an understanding of the background of our text and understand the significance uh, centered around this. Now, much can be said uh, by just the first two verses, and then we'll look into uh, the background along with these verses. Now, it's titled as Wrong Focus and Witnessed Slavery and Willing Slavery. Bondage, captivity. The first verse reads, How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods? But now, after that you have known God, or rather, are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Now, when we, when we think of the two scriptures, verses 8 and 9, it's good for us to uh, focus our attention on the commentary, or I should say the reputation, that was uh, attributed to the Galatians. And uh, it was spoken that the Galatians, uh, they were fickle-minded. Uh, they had a love for new and curious things. And uh, they also impulsive. They were driven by force and violence and they were, they were passionate and they had fervor in their curiosity of things. And uh, along with this, there were also other 
uh, factors or fractions that were involved in the influencing of the Galatians. And in the midst of that, there were also the influence of the Pharisees. And the, uh, they were fer referred to as Judaizers. And uh, they were coming with the requirements of the law. Now, last week we were talking about um, being in bondage to uh, the law. And this week, uh, our background text, Romans, the eighth chapter and verses one through 11, talks to us about the war of the flesh against the spirit. And it emphasizes that tug of war that's going on where the flesh is trying to live according to certain morals or fleshly standards and according to certain customs. But, but some of the law has been imposed by the will of man. And those run contrary to fulfilling spiritual requirements. And it is good for us to read Romans 8, verses 1 through 11, to really get a good, better understanding of the drive or the direction of our lesson. Now, the lesson tells us that uh, we also, or that the Galatians also, uh, that they when they didn't know God, that they were in service to other gods. And uh, this, this was uh, cited in Acts, the 17th chapter, verses 22 through 29. And, and in that particular uh, section of the text, it tells us that there was an inscription uh, in the temple where they were entering and there was an inscription uh, that read to the unknown God. So I, I, I would just like to read uh, what Paul shares with us out of the book of Acts, uh, just to kind of lay the background here. Uh, verse 22 says, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So we see that there were other Forces. There were other dynamics that were present to a people that we mentioned earlier were like eagerly receptacle. They were vulnerable for curiosity and things that were new and interesting and such. And these are the challenges that Paul is up against. And so when we talk about the uh, unknown God and the different gods and uh, forms of worship that were going on, we, we know that uh, in Greek history that the Greek had the uh, pantheon of gods and they had like 12 different gods that were labeled and they had Zeus and Poseidon and they had Hades and Athena and Apollo and Aphrodite and they had a list of gods and these gods had certain practices uh, that would surface during different parts of the year, uh, which we will see later on in the lesson. And uh, some of the customs uh, 
that were established was that uh, some performed sexual acts uh, to a god at a particular month out of the year. And then there were some where you had to make sacrifices. Some of those were animal sacrifices and others were human sacrifices. And then there were others where you had to bring wealth. Uh, you had to bring something that was of value to the gods. And so these were the other dynamics that were going on during that time. And then we had another stipulation, which, which was coming from the religious sect, and that was from the Jews of that day. Um, the Jews of that day. And uh, they uh, had a large requirement, and uh, it was centered around circumcision. And this was uh, spoken of in the 15th chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, they said, you must be circumcised and keep the law. And this presented quite an argument because Paul began to distinguish between uh, what significance did circumcision play in the behavior and in the character of the individuals that were circumcised compared to those who were not. And so we want to look at a couple of scriptures just to highlight the significance of this great debate and argument centered around a requirement of you must be circumcised. The first scripture uh, that I want to lift is out of the second chapter of Romans. And uh, I want to start it at the uh, 17th verse. And it, it pretty much just speaks volumes uh, by itself. Uh, basically, it doesn't even need interpretation because it is so direct and straightforward. Uh, but I chose this because it's speaking to the Jews, and it's speaking of the Jews, and this is the uh, set, this is the group that is imposing these requirements to Paul upon the Gentiles and saying that these things must be done. So Paul lifts the very thing that they raise question about, which is circumcision. And he addresses it in this light. He says, indeed, you are called a Jew and you rest on the law and make your boast in God. And you know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you not rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you not dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. As it is written, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And 
will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you, who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Now, I take that as being to the point, straightforward, not dibbling and dabbling and beating around the bush, but just calling it straight out as it is. And so as we uh, go further into the lesson, um, we want to keep this background in the forefront of our minds as we're looking at these scriptures because it helps us to understand how they apply. Now let's, let's look at verses uh, 10 and uh, let's look at verse 11. Uh, verse 10 tells us that you observe days and months and times and years. Let, let, let's pause right here. Uh, because we know that uh, in the law, we are not trying to discredit or to diminish uh, any of the uh, ceremonial practices of uh, the Jews and, uh, in adherence to the law of Moses. Um, we know that they had great significance and purpose, but they were a foreshadowing of the coming of the one who was going to fulfill the law. So we recognize that there were weekly Sabbaths and they had uh, new moon festivals and uh, the annual feasts like the Passover. And uh, then there was the year of Jubilee. And, and we know that all of those things had significance, but we realize that in Matthew, uh, the fifth chapter and the 17th verse, that Christ said, think not that I have come to destroy the law, but I have come to fulfill the law. And when the one that the law has prepared us for and gotten us into the practice and recognition of that one, when that one is present, then we have moved from the practice of law to the fulfillment of the law. A good illustration of this, uh, speaking of what happens when the one who fulfills the law, and of course we're talking about Christ, uh, how that changes the behavior of those in his midst at that time. Uh, a good illustration of this is in the uh, fifth chapter of Luke, and Christ is talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and uh, they uh, question him. So I'm going to read it. It's the fifth chapter of Luke, and it's the 33rd verse. And it says, Then they said to him, How do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Christ answered them this way. And he said to them, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? See, once once what we have been practicing in ceremonies uh, once the one that we were recognizing and the one we were paying homage and respect to is present, well, well, then we don't need to go through the motions or through the formalities of things because now the one that our attention was directed towards is with us. So Christ is saying to the Pharisees, uh, that, uh, yeah, they're not doing it at this moment because I am present. But look at what he says in the next verse. Uh, in verse 34, he says, But the days will come when the bridegroom, speaking of himself, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Okay. Verse 11 says, I am afraid of you 
lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Now Paul is starting to question that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm seeing and I'm hearing what's going on uh, among you Galatians, and uh, uh, I've taken this to heart, and uh, you, I, I really am starting to wonder, uh, is my labor in vain? Uh, because I, I, I am serious about this, and I'm really afraid for you, for what will happen to you if you are overtaken, overtaken by these other influences. So then he goes on to explain to them of just how, just how involved and just how uh, serious and, and how committed he is to this. And then he explains to them that, brethren, I beseech you for as I am, for I am as you are. Now, let me say that again. I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as you are. And, and here Paul uh, explains about how he became as they were. So they could receive him. And so now he's asking for them to become as he is. And, and, and we find this uh, in, in the scripture. First, first Corinthians, the ninth chapter, and I'm just going to read verses 19 uh, through 23. And it says, for though I am free from all men, because uh, Paul as we know, he was Saul and he was a Roman citizen and he had freedom. He was never in bondage. And he said, I am free from all men. I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews to those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law to those who are without law as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law towards Christ that I might win those who are without the law to the weak. I became weak that I might win the weak. I became all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now, that's a fine line right there because we also know that in Acts, he was brought up uh, before the Sanhedrin and uh, he was questioned about his behavior of how uh, he was in violation to requirements of the law because of things that he was partaking in, things that he was eating. And so um, it's a fine line when we become all things to all people because uh, people are fragile. And in uh, our infirmities, in our weaknesses, sometimes we will use a good cause and a good purpose to throw that back in the face of someone so that it justifies or it legitimizes my weakness. So therefore, you can't judge me because while you were with us, you were doing what we were doing. So now you're trying to tell us that we need to change our behavior and we need to become more like this. Well, then why didn't you uphold that example while you were with us? So we have to be careful about becoming all things to all men. Now we go further and, and Paul here begins to address the uh, uncertain status of the Galatians. And, and he says that you have not injured me at all because Paul had, all, had been on other uh, missionary uh, uh, trips uh, where... He had been stoned and had been beaten, but he tells them that you hadn't injured me at all. And he says that, you know how through my 
infirmity, through the weakness of my flesh, I was sick. I preached the gospel unto you at first. And their response was as though they were blessed by it. So verse 15, um, I'm sorry, let's go to 14. And it says, and my temptation was in my flesh and you despised not, nor did you reject me. But you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ. So even when Paul was sick and uh, the text makes uh, inquiries about uh, the uh, wording of the infirmity of his flesh. And it's not uh, it addresses it as though this may have been an illness. It may have been a sickness of his or it may have been also where Paul talked about that he had a thorn in his flesh. Uh, he wanted God to remove it from him. But God told him that uh, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And he did not remove it from Paul. But it doesn't identify exactly what he was speaking to, but it does talk about how it was received. And he says that even though he was sick and he still came before them, that they didn't uh, reject him, that they didn't despise what he was saving, but he made such an impression that they actually uh, equated him with an angel of God. And he says, even as Christ. So he says, well, since that was how you received me, then where is then the blessedness that you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible because of the impression that he made on him, he said, you said you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me because what Paul was teaching them. It was a it was a lifting for them. It was encouraging. It was inspiring. It was freeing them from what they were hearing in other gatherings. And so then Paul says, so as a result of this, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Because Paul began to speak against the other influences that were present in Galatia at the time. And so now he's asking them, so because I tell you the truth, are you now, am I an enemy of yours now? Um, at one moment you were praising me to the high heavens and now I, I'm detecting that there's some dissension here. And then he goes on to talk about misplaced eagerness. And he says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yeah, they would exclude you that you might affect them. Now, it says, but it is a good thing to be zealous. It's a good thing to have zeal. Always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. Now let's back up and go back to here where he's talking about and they zealously affect you. Harmful enthusiasm. And to that I would like to lift uh, from Second Peter uh, the second chapter verses 19 through 21. And it reads, while they promised them liberty... They themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. So Paul is saying that while they come with great enthusiasm and eagerness and all of that fervor and such, he says that check the record and see what their motivation is from. And it says that they are slaves of their own corruption. And any person that is overcome with corruption, he also is brought in bondage. Then he, the scripture says, for if after they had escaped the pollutions of the world 
through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And here I want to go right back to the beginning verse that says, after you have known God or rather are known of God, how can you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, the teachings and the, the foundations of things, principles that are laid before you? And so it says, uh, after they had escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So after they had been informed, after they had been enlightened, then it says, then they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter is worse than them that I mean, the latter is worse for them than the beginning. When you don't know and the information that you are receiving is forwarded to you, well, if you don't know any better, if you don't know what the word of God says, if you don't have another foundation to balance that with, well, then you're not as affected as someone else who has been informed who does know what the foundation of the word says. And then after they have received knowledge and after they have known Christ, then they decide to go back into the world because now you have had a visitation of the spirit of God. And that visitation will not turn you loose when you choose to go back into bondage or back into worldliness. And then the scripture ends by saying this, and this is verse 21, and it says, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. So as we said, uh, Paul is in a struggle here and he is trying to uh, fulfill his mission and he is trying to make certain that the Galatians understand what is before them and in the uh, last verse in the 20th verse it says I, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. Paul was desiring and he was, he was having anxiety. He was, he was really anticipating wanting to be present with the Galatians because he wanted the tone of his own voice to change. And he felt that if he was with them, if he was in their presence, that he would sense spiritually where they were and it would either convince him that he needed to do more work or it would relieve him and allow him to recognize that, that it was not as bad as what he anticipated. So as we leave you today, uh, we hope that something that was said, of course, uh, has been a blessing to you or that it has given you some direction or has clarified uh, some things relative to our uh, lesson for this Sunday. And as always, it is our prayer that the continued blessings of our Lord Christ Jesus and our God be upon you now and always. God bless you.